Was that a big win as well tonight for David Moyes, Jamie? We saw him not do his usual clapping on the pitch. He went straight down the tunnel after that victory. Yeah, I think coming into the game tonight, it's the standalone game. You know, always is on Monday night football. All eyes are on the game. We know, and certainly highlighted before the game, the poor run that they've been on. There's been, obviously, banners in the crowd. You think of the game away in Nottingham Forest. So I think he'd been coming into this game with a little bit of trepidation about the feeling maybe in the stadium. And to win, but win the way they did. I mean, to score four goals, you know, exciting bonus to hatch a great goal from Emerson. It was, it was a big night for David Moyes. And listen, we highlighted a lot at the start of the show, the great job he's done, but we also understand the frustration of the supporters in terms of the style of play. So you play at home and you score four goals, win in that way, some great goals as well. I think it's been a great night all round for West Ham. But more importantly, David Moyes, because if he is to leave at the end of the season or stay, who knows, you, you wouldn't want to go out on a really bad negative run. And hopefully for him and West Ham, this, you know, there's a start of getting back into form. Where they are on the table is still a great position where they find themselves in. Did they deserve it, do you think, Gail, tonight, for their attacking play? Yeah, well, like Jimmy said, at the beginning of the game, we're talking about points that can be done better and I think uh, today it was the case. They were more proactive, they were more aggressive, uh, less space in between lines and like we were saying before, this game can show us the style of you know, game plan of David Moyes, you know, the fullback overlapping, uh, good goal aggressivity down the park. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very good performance and like Jamie said, I think you know, in football it's either you're good or you're bad. He's doing well, we know what he's done and tonight you know, it's great to, to go home with the, with the points. Mikel Antonio came back last week after three months out injured, but tonight when Pakatar was fit again, Antonio is the player to make way and it feels like David Moyes is really comfortable with Jared Bowen through the middle. I like the way he analyzed himself because the goals, I was going to give him credit for the, for the pressing that he did on the first goal and then the following on the, on the second goal, the, the link up. I think when you have those kind of players, like we said at the beginning, like Paqueta, uh, him, you need to be able to control the ball. You need to be able to pass and to link up. If you don't have that, he, he said it himself. If you play long ball down the channel, he will do it because he's the kind of guy that will give everything, but his qualities, he's got beautiful sense of you know space you know you've seen him a couple of times when he get the ball he check over the shoulder he's a great player they have great players so hopefully that's tonight maybe the the click for them to Another go on turning but, uh, point yeah, yeah that he would hope so they would certainly hope so david moyes would as well come on gail give us your best shot at analyzing that goal for us i mean the the, the strike is clean uh you can tell that it's exactly what he wants to. Sometimes you can score a crazy goal when you don't really know the ball is coming and you just hit it first time, but you can clearly see what he's doing. The balance, the technique, the ball is not moving. I think that's the kind of technique that I could see color of scoring goals, you know? Yes. It's just a perfect strike. It's interesting because later on, in the, later in the game, we get through the analysis on the game, we're going to get to inverted fullbacks and the positions they take up. Is the fact that he's so central, is that probably the the modern way, which you normally expect probably sort of years ago, you probably, a left back would be here, but because of the way teams set up now and the full back positions they take, they're going to find themselves in their positions more often. Yes, probably. And, and also, if you see the goal that uh, they scored tonight, you know, most of the time it's, you have key, key zone and key areas now on the pitch where obviously you can score from anywhere, but there, there are zones that will give you more chances of, of being efficient. And being in, in here, you can control the, the, on the lost ball and obviously you can be on the rebound. And, and, and if you have the quality to hit it from there, it's, it's beautiful. But you're right, you know, the fact that we are asking the players, the, the fullback to be a little bit more narrow now, you can get on, onto those balls. So look, at, look at Suchek's reaction. He can't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> he can't believe it. <laughs> it. Could well be more of David Moyes around the London Stadium, says they might have been pushed into that contract situation because of... Uh, the public conversations that people like us have been having about the, the situation. I, I think, Jamie, the, the line that's going to get picked up is by West Ham fans might be, you know, we should be happy to be top half West Ham United. Yeah, there's no doubt that sometimes David Moyes will come up with a line and he'll think that's... When you look at history of West Ham in the Premier League, they are a team who at times can be dragged down to the bottom at times are close to Europe, and more often than not, probably somewhere in between that. So I think what David Moyes is saying, in the main, in the Premier League, if West Ham are in the top half of the table, it's a, decent, it's a good season. But on the back of West Ham moving from Upton Park to the Olympic Stadium, 60,000 people, we talk about the money that's being spent as well, the quality of play that they've got now. Pakatar is a player who, who Manchester City basically wanted to sign in the summer. So that's where there might be a little bit of a friction 
between supporters and what David Moyes is saying because, as we said last week, don't forget, with Crystal Palace, every set of supporters always wants to feel like the club is looking to push on and move on. So West Ham don't want to accept we're just a top-half club, but they haven't just been a top-half club with David Moyes, they've been in Europe. He referenced it a couple of times there, Gail. Does, does a, much of West Ham's success this season rest on that front three? Pakata, who returned tonight, Kudus, who has switched back to his favoured right-hand side, and Jared Bowen, who got his first goal since December. Well, you win and you lose game in both boxes. So when you have players of those calibre who can make a game and out of nothing create something and score goals, obviously you have more chance of winning. It doesn't mean you're going to have success, but it just means that you can be more... Uh, performing better. I think the, the problem with him is that he's, he's the victim of his own success, if I, if I can say. You know, West Ham reaching final of uh, European competition, getting the trophy. Obviously, after that, you try to go a step above. It's not easy. It takes time. Will they give him time? Hopefully, but they have players to do much better than what they did up to tonight. So, uh, tonight was great. Let's, let's hope they can, they can push on with this. Well, that is a horrible set of results. No team has lost more games since the start of December than the 10 in 12 games that Brentford have lost. Can you see confidence draining from them, Gail? I think Jenny had, uh, had the point at the beginning. It's a club who is very much driven by, by data and we've seen success. You know, success can be achieved with many different you know, ways. They're having success with what, they, what, what, with what they do and what they have. Obviously, this is not a good run. It's draining. It's draining for players. I've never been in a club with a situation like this, so I can't really tell you how it is. But I know when your confidence goes down, it's very much difficult to, uh, to kick on. So we've seen the striker coming back, allowing them to score a few goals. but. You know, when you start a game like this, there's not much you can do, really. You made the point, Jamie, that Brentford are a club, Gail talks about data, that looks more at that than probably anybody else. And they, we were showing some numbers that, that seems to suggest that actually they should be much higher at the table. They should be in the top half, potentially. But when they're looking at this, surely anxiety has to creep in. Oh, of course it will do. But, I mean, when we looked at those fixtures, the only thing I would say, since Tony came back, the scoring goals, and actually since he came back, uh, against Nottingham Forest, the game that they won, one of the two games that they won. I think there's only five teams in the Premier League who've actually scored more goals than them since that point. So they've got that, that a lot of teams at the bottom haven't got in terms of goals. But on the back of what happened to Everton, we still don't know what's going to happen with Everton in the future and Nottingham Forest, how that's going to affect teams near the bottom as well. But they've got a little cushion there to Luton, but that can go very quickly. And I think sooner or later, we always believe that the, you know, the data or the analytics will pay you back in terms of where they should be in the league. And Thomas Frank will hope that'll be the case over the next 12 games. So I, just st I still think that they've got enough, certainly with the striker that they've got. And I think at home, they're capable of getting results against anybody. The, the problem with the data is uh, are really, you know, you control so much and you know so much about the players, but you, you, you're not in the player's body, in yeah. the player's mind. And when you lose a confident, when you lose players out of confident and bad performances, that I cannot uh, regulate this. And this is something that I've seen it with my team in Toulouse, you know, uh, well, Not much a great more. name, is it? <laughs> <laughs> no, but they're doing great. They're doing great, actually. They, they won against Liverpool uh, not, not long ago. But it's the same situation. They found themselves in a position where they should have been higher, but they are not. Do you have the quality to actually make the, the, the things go up? Sometimes you don't. Gail Clichy is our special guest tonight, title-winning left-back with Arsenal, Manchester City, French international as well, but right-footed. Yes. Explain. Wow, it's a long story, but uh, <laughs> basically, you know... Hope we've got about 15 minutes. <laughs> he, he likes it. Eh? Uh, no, basically, my dad was my first coach. Um, and as every dad, you know, he was giving me challenges. I was the best player when I was young, like many, many of us. And, uh, and basically goals were not allowed if I was scoring with my stronger foot. So then I developed some kind of way of playing with my weaker foot. And, um, and that's it. Uh, I don't think he did that with an idea of me becoming, you know, the player I became. Uh, but as we said, you know, dads always got the, the answers. How beneficial is that for you? Because when you listen to like a, the normal supporter, they actually get frustrated and say, why can't a player play with two feet? Why don't you practice with your weaker foot? But very, very few players are, are competent with their weaker foot. How much of a benefit was that to you as a player? I think that's a very good, good point that you, 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 you're mentioning. And I would take a bit of time, but I wouldn't class myself as a... As a, as a two-footed players, like someone like uh, Santi Casola or, or Dembele from PSG. Um, 
but he helped you. He helped you because obviously if I block your right foot and you don't have uh, your left foot, then, you know, I I've got, you know, uh, advance on you. But I'm, I'm now working with Cherry with the under-21 and we played against a friendly game against Korea. Um, and I'm watching the games and analyzing the last five games and I can see five players that can play both feet, like Casola. And I'm thinking, you know, after 22 years of career, I only met two players that are able to perform like this. So I'm a little bit curious. And, and, and when we play them, after the game, I went to speak to one of their coach and I said, okay, I've got something to ask you. You know, it's very weird. And, and, and for me, it's surprising to see that you have five, six players that can use equally well both feet. And he told us very young age, we don't ask them to play both feet we force them to play. So they have a way of making sure players can be balanced. And I find this very fascinating because I'm thinking if I can have tomorrow a team and I can find myself with two, three, four, five players that can equally play both feet, that's a hell of an advantage. So uh, I'm going to go and, and, and you know, spend some time with them. But yes, definitely you can see Casola, you know, set pieces right, left. Uh, you close his, his left foot, then he will go on the right. Uh, you close his right because, you know, he's a good shoot. He's got a good, a good shoot, then he will chop it and, and use his left. I think, you know, that's something that we should encourage during the academy because that's uh, very valuable. So tell us about uh, Gail Clichy developing then. You had this, this talent to play with, with both feet, which your, your dad had nurtured. I'm guessing you had this natural athleticism as well. So where did you find a role in a football team, first of all? I think, I think you know, you, you realise quickly that you are someone that people want in their team when you're very young. Mm -hmm. And then obviously you've been signed to a professional team in Cannes. You started to play and recognize certain abilities that you have, and then obviously you know you sign for a team like Arsenal with but, but Arsene going, Wenger. With going back to Cannes, what, what position was it, or what were the abilities so, that you? That so you when showed? I signed for Cannes, I'm a number ten, believe it or not. Um, but then obviously when I arrived there and they tell me you're going to play defenders, you're going to be a defender. You have two ways of welcoming the news. Either you go down because you feel that you are a striker or offensive player and you are closed and you don't want to play that position or you just embrace it. But why do you think they said that? Probably because I wasn't a good number 10, you know. Um, I had obviously capacity and ability to run uh, a lot. I was always clean on the ball. Um, I was never a risky player. You know, if you compare my period with uh, City and, and, and Kolarov, it was much more elegant and, and beautiful to see free kicks and crosses but I was probably more composed, losing less balls. And I will say that in today's football, I will be the kind of player that will facilitate the, the build-up from, from the back. But... Um, where, yeah. where do you think... It's interesting you say you're a number 10. I think, basically, you become a freshman footballer. I'm the same. Most players, you're the best player in the school team. You're the best player probably in your area or the team that you play for. And normally the best player would normally play central midfield or centre forward. I would say you, you, you were a number 10. I was a centre forward as a youngster. And I think that story is probably similar mm -hmm. with a lot of players who maybe end up as defenders. What, what type of level do you think you could have got to if you'd have stayed in that position? Forward? Yeah, yeah like, a, like a number 10. Probably nowhere. <laughs> you know, if we're being honest, you know, at one point, you know, you play at youth level. And if someone is thinking that you're not good enough, then perhaps, you know, you will never reach anything. One thing that's very interesting, and obviously we will never know, but I would have loved to... I've met Pep earlier because, first of all, you know, the way he sees football really, you know, I connect with that. Uh, but I also believe that I was, like I said before, I wasn't very adventurous, but I was more concerned about not losing the ball and, and making sure my teammates are in good position. So I would have loved to have a chance to play in that role, you know, coming inside, which I enjoyed a bit, you know, in his first season. But yeah, I think, you know, we all got abilities. I wasn't good enough to play up front. I only scored three goals. Like, Are you, you know. saying you would have played up front for England then? Is that, well, <laughs> is that where the question was coming from? I did play for England at under-16 <laughs> level, so let's uh, get that. But <laughs> you mentioned Pep, and we're talking about the inverted full-backs. I mean, we wanted to look at your... You basically played in Pep Guardiola's first game yes. for Manchester City as an sort of inverted fullback. We just want to highlight that and, and look at it and just you know get it in the screen and probably have a little look. So... This is 2016. I've got a nice seat here, so you're going to get up and have a look. Yeah, go on, go on, have a look. Go on, have a look. Come on, let's go on. Well, Gail, I just wanted to ask you, and this is probably what what is slightly different now. Yeah, you go on that side, and we keep talking about Pep and, and the inverted fullback, but 
this is probably different to what we see now it's evolved so actually in the build-up so you see gail you, you get involved there and explain this and explain your role here i think it's sanya's role here well I, you know to start with so it's, it's only the first game of the season and basically he's trying to tell a lot of work on the pitch a lot of also talk but what he wants is to make the the, the, the pitch big i think he comes to england and he knows that the game is fast and you have very powerful wingers fast wingers on the transition that can hurt you so what he tells me is that he, he's just explaining to me that being inside when we lose the ball obviously you will always in control of your winger being wide if you lose the ball you will never you know, that's so, you here i'm here so for, for him for, for for example if i'm here as a, as a fullback that we used to see before you lose the ball here and we find that winger you being higher than him you will never reach back to him so you can't defend so his first idea is to control the wingers but also when you have the ball to have like now we can see three plus two to build up if you look here it's three it's, it's two center backs and three with Sanya uh, Fernandinho and me so it changed a bit but at the beginning it's really to control the wingers and to make so sure it's that a defensive we can... move first you think? yeah I, I believe so I believe so and then obviously you know his philosophy and what he told me is that Usually you have the wing, the, the fullbacks really high giving you the width. And he said most of the time when you reach that player on one on one with the opposite fullback, you don't have the abilities to go one on one and create something. So you control the ball and you play back. He said now having the winger giving you the width and you being inside, you're in a natural position to actually defend if we lose the ball and you leave your strong players on one on one. So you can see the Mares, you can see the Sane, you can see the Sterling, Robin. Ribéry, that, that's what he wants. He preferred to have those players on one-on-one. -on -one. I think just leave this clip here. I just want to notice something here. You said before about the build-up of the two and the three. I actually prefer the three and yes. the two because I think the two wide, wider players can then step in. But what's interesting here is when you find yourself in this position, is that Fernandinho there? Yes. He's actually now dropping in between the centre-backs to make the three. the three. So does that then mean... It, so I'm trying to think of Pep Guardiola's coaching and the messages to you because the pitch is always changing. So Fernandinho's in here. He's trying to receive the ball from the centre-backs. Now Fernandinho drops in between his centre-backs. Does that mean then there's more onus on you now to get involved yes. and be involved? in the build-up yes basically if you play with uh, two strikers then you will want the free to create that you know spare man and obviously when something like this happened I remember a session where we were playing like this and we were working on it working on it the signal was Fernandino goes there then obviously I have to come here to create the two and David will come in the half space and you find that box that you you, you spoke about and and all of this during my time was to leave the space free for the people on the side so again later in the in, in his time you had Leroy Sané and you had Sterling yeah. and you had Mares so you can imagine being a right back having a one-on-one -on -one with 50 meters in your back a player controlling the ball and actually you know driving at you of this quality is very difficult to defend you know Pep Guardiola better than anyone you know you know him as soon as he comes to to England and we associate him with Obviously, ticky tacky, great football, attack and play goals. Is this a guy who puts as much emphasis on his training sessions and his setup of his team, actually defensively and being organised, especially for counter attacks? But I think that's what people want to see because we want to see, you know, we're talking about West Ham and we're saying it's not enough because we want attractive football and we want offensive football. Yes, of course, but if you don't concede goals, you don't lose a game. And for him, that, you know, phase of fullback coming in start with the fact that you can defend better because you have your strong defenders actually set and always in advance to the wingers so his first thought are defending if we lose the ball because the only way you can hurt Pep's team is on the transition or set pieces from that moment you work on set pieces you are focused and you know you don't concede and you don't concede the transition how don't you concede the transition having your defenders defending rather than having your fullback really wide you lose the ball and then you open. That's very simple, but that's 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 his that's his aim. Come sit back, back down, Gail. If oh, if we'll um, be up all night. if um, <laughs> if Pep Guardiola, you think you know, we, you talked about <clears throat> this sort of this shift and coming full circle for Pep Guardiola, and now he's got these almost four centre backs across the back four at times. If he was to create his prototype fullback, what do you think it would actually look like? I think he doesn't have prototype. He, he's got the luxury of having a club that can support him in what he wants. So, for instance, when we left, he went to get uh, Benjamin Mendy and Kai Walker. 
And he also had the luxury to play Fabien Delph, a midfield, who played left back when Benjamin Mendy got injured. So I don't think you can... I think Pep is very good at... Um, he has his own philosophy, but he's very good at adapting to the team. So the weakness of the opponent, he will play on that. Today, he's got the chance to have the best defenders who are also very much composed on the ball. You, I, I will not name names, but you have clubs that couldn't even dream of doing it because the players are not equipped to have the ball and keep the ball under pressure. We can all keep the ball, but to accept the pressure, you know, so you attract someone to come and last minute you find the third man, you know, through, through your teammates, it's not given to a, a, anyone. So he's lucky because he can have both. He can have strong defenders who are mobile, uh, fast, and that can play football. You I think it's interesting what he said there. <laughs> Sorry, Dave, is that we keep going back to that clip. You're involved in you know, the fullbacks coming in, and, and teams are doing that now in, in different ways. But after one year in the Premier League, he almost went away from that. And the two fullbacks you're talking about, mm -hmm. Mendy and certainly Kyle Walker. I remember last season him saying Kyle Walker's not capable of going in there to play into midfield. So after being here a year, he almost bore what you'd ex almost like you could say are uh, typical Premier League fullbacks, you know, powerful, real energy to get up and down this, the side. So, I mean, it's, I, I always feel as if Pep's slightly ahead of everyone and people are almost copying or trying to take little chinks. And why wouldn't you? He's the best. But he's now in terms of, he's put the centre back in there now. It's John Stones, isn't it, rather than a fullback going there, it's John Stones. But not any centre-back, John Stones. We, we can see yes. it with, you know, example, Liverpool are trying with Gomez. And it's, it's working, but it's not working the way we expect and probably Klopp want him to, to do. So you have to recognise the attribute of your you, players and play on your strength. You work with some great managers. You obviously talk about Pep Guardiola as, you know, right up there as, as someone who's very special. But what qualities would Arsene Wenger have had, perhaps, that are slightly different that, that maybe Pep Guardia would have liked to have had? I think it's a different generation, but I think the, the, what Arsene had, he was able to identify your strongest quality and make you great within his methodology, his game plan, accordingly to, to your quality. So if you look at the left back, you had um, Van Brokost, you had uh, Ashley Cole, you had Gael Clichy, you had Karen Gibbs, you had Armand Traore, all different, but in a way, all similar. On the right, you had the same. You had Lorenz, Sanya, Ebue. So I think in his head, he had a game plan, a methodology, and basically he was going Saul Campbell, Johan Juru, Pascal Sigan, Senderos. So pretty much the player that look to have the same attribute, 4-4-2, and then he evolved in 4-3-3. But uh, I think that was his strength. He was asking you to play with... He wasn't trying to develop your weakness. He wanted, to you, he wanted you to play on your strongest points. And I think that was his, uh, his way, and I think he did, he did well, like, really well like this. Quick answer. Who's the best left-back in the world right now? If, if we count, I don't know, it's, it's very difficult, but if we count Ake as, as being a, a left-back, because that's the position he's playing, you can't really argue that he's, he's, he's not up there. But I really like Cancelo before he left for, 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 for the argument they had. I think at that moment, Cancelo is, is the best in the position. Final thought, Gail. And it's interesting, a lot of the questions that we've asked you on, on various things, you've brought it back round to some sort of tactical analysis. It's clearly the way that you're sort of programmed. And you've, you've mentioned a couple of times, you're working with Thierry Henry, with France under 21s, and I think the Olympic team as well, mm -hmm. moving forward. Is this where you see yourself now? And would you like your own team to coach one day and what would it look like? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's a process really. And uh, when I left City after working with Pep, it was really the moment where I felt, obviously I, I'm getting older, so I'm starting to think ahead. And I'm thinking when I'm watching this guy, Pep, it's actually beautiful to, to see. Put aside the result and the silverware and the trophies and all the fame, because obviously that's, that's, that's his story but the details and the effort that he puts into every training session and the way he manages his group. You like him or you don't like him, you will have different opinion. It was beautiful to see. So I'm thinking, OK, I'm going to try it. And then obviously I'm going to Istanbul. Uh, I have a cl close relationship with the manager. And then from there, I can either go back to France or come back to England. And I decided to go to Geneva, a smaller club where I will have a little bit more responsibility, starting to pass my badges and obviously since the moment I started to work with Pep, it's hard for me to distance myself 
from his philosophy. Mm -hmm. And the chance I have today is that I stopped playing football and I found myself the assistant of Thierry, who is pretty much on the same arm, on the same line as, as him. So um, would I want to be a coach one day? Yes. Would I be good enough? We're working on it. But, um, you know, eight years at Arsenal, six years at City. Uh, I've been champion in, in Istanbul also. Um, I've been lucky to have teams where we possess the ball and we, we play attractive football. Will I be able to do it? Uh, hopefully, yeah, hopefully. And an amazing yeah. communicator in two languages as well, which gives you a great <laughs> advantage. Gail, we've really enjoyed having you with us tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.